ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show that covers all things marketing. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast gives you the latest marketing news, from what major businesses have planned for the coming year, to the newest trends in advertising, from podcasts, digital and streaming, to the old standbys of radio, television, and billboards. Whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand, you've come to the right place. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast starts now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the GSMC Marketing Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Today, we are going to be taking a magical journey to the wonderful world of Harry Potter. Harry Potter is a beloved book series, movie franchise, world theme park, Broadway show, you name it, there is something to do with Harry Potter. So obviously with that entire world that has been created by J.K. Rowling and a team of marketing experts, it would only make sense for us to take a look at some of the marketing strategies they have used to help create and promote that world. So on today's episode, we are going to be taking a look at some of the stats and facts that go along with Harry Potter. We're going to be taking a look at some of the marketing strategies they have used and how you can use them. We are also going to be talking about the world outside of the books. As many of you know, there have been movies created about Harry Potter, spin-off films, a theme park now that is available in three different locations. There's also this entire world of merchandise that goes along with the Harry Potter books that we're going to explore today. And then at the end of today's podcast, stay tuned because we are going to be talking about 10 other books that have a similar marketing background as Harry Potter. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Right now, though, I would love to remind everybody to please subscribe to this podcast. We post new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're also very, very active on social media, and I really love interacting with you guys on all of our social media platforms and on the podcast itself. So if you have thoughts, comments, concerns, or questions about anything we talk about on today's podcast or on any of our other podcasts, then go ahead and write a review, write a comment, tweet at me, comment on Instagram, comment on YouTube, because we really love hearing from you guys, and we really love carrying on this discussion outside of the podcast, so make sure to do that. So let's get right into it with some stats and facts you might not know about the wizarding world of Harry Potter. The estimated value of the Harry Potter franchise is over $20 billion. That is including all of the books, movies, theme park, merchandise, toys, accessories, makeup, Lego, everything you could imagine. It can all be boiled down to over $20 billion. The Harry Potter books have sold over 500 million copies and have been released in over 80 languages. The Harry Potter films have grossed over $7 billion. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 single-handedly brought in $1.3 billion in global box office sales. $600 million is the estimated global box office of the 2016 spin-off Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. This demonstrated that the global passion for Harry Potter is still alive and well even after the original movies and books have been released. But we are going to be talking more about the uh, other franchises outside of the Harry Potter world that are still connected, such as Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, later in the podcast, so make sure you stay tuned for that. The Wizarding World of Harry Potter opened in 2010 when park attendance increased by roughly 30% after its opening. A rare first edition of the Philosopher's Stone containing a typo on the back cover misspelling Philosopher as Phil Osper, uh, that was a weird way to sound it out, but basically it's P-H-I-O-S-P-H-E-R, has sold for more than $55,000 at a 2016 auction. Harry Potter is beloved, and it is something that has made J.K. Rowling, Daniel Radcliffe, Emma Watson, Rupert Grint, and many of the other producers and marketing people that were involved a lot of money and has given all of them quite a bit of notoriety. And it's really because of the love for the franchise that has sort of sparked this entire world of content. It's not just a book series. It may have started as a very successful book series, but it has since spiraled into this into this completely different world that people can go into on their own and sort of explore and relate to in a way that 
not a lot of other books and movies have really done that or have had the ability to do that and have been able to stay around in pop culture and in our society for as long as Harry Potter has. It appeals to youth. It appeals to children. It appeals to people 30 plus, 40 plus, 50 plus, men and women. People around the world are in love with the series. So it only makes sense that we would take a look at it as today. And as you can tell by these numbers, it is clearly worth taking a closer look at just due to how much money and how much time is put into this book series. Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and take a short break from the podcast. But when we come back, we're going to be talking about some of the marketing strategies that were used in the Harry Potter franchise. So stay tuned for that because you are listening to the GSMC Marketing Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mackenzie Jaquish, and I'll be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Technology Podcast covers everything tech. The hottest mobile phones, tablets, games. We review it, rate it, test it. Whether you're Microsoft or Apple, Android or iPhone, we'll give it to you again and again. Black and white. The Golden State Media Concepts Technology Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Marketing Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mackenzie Jaquish, and on today's podcast, we are talking about Harry Potter and Harry Potter marketing. Harry Potter marketing is so interesting because, of course, and we're going to talk about this, the product itself was great. People loved Harry Potter from the start. Did it need the marketing push that it got? Absolutely. You can still have this amazing book. It will still be successful. But will it be Harry Potter level of success? No, this was marketing. This was a marketing team. This required strategies and testing and building an entire marketing plan around the series of books around one little boy finding out he's a wizard that it created this entire world. So we are going to take a look right now at the eight strategies that were used in the Harry Potter marketing plan that helped create such a big world and such a big franchise. So number one, the good product. It all starts with the fact that the first Harry Potter book was a good product. People wanted to read it. It was well written. It had interesting characters. It was something that we really hadn't experienced before because it was, you know, science fiction, but mystery, and it was real world. It was a family. It was a human impactful story. It was a children's story, but you understood it if you were older. There were just so many things that went into making Harry Potter such a good book that it then made it so much easier to market. But Harry Potter was such a good book and was such a good product that that's really how the seed got planted. That's why people were so excited and that's why people were so intrigued and excited and ready to be a part of this world and were ready to be marketed to. The next thing they did was they developed a strategic approach. So it's not like they were like, all right, let's do billboards and magazine covers and guerrilla marketing and social media marketing, even though that wasn't quite a thing when Harry Potter got started. It was definitely a thing at the end of Harry Potter with social media marketing, and it was definitely utilized for the later films and is utilized today for continuing on the Harry Potter brand. But at the beginning, they really had to be strategic about how they were going to market Harry Potter 
who they were going to target the books to, how they were going to sell it, if they were going to sell it to make it into a movie, if they were going to create a world outside of it, what would that look like? Everything was done super strategically, and everything was done in order to complement and supplement the original product. So again, it really goes back to that first step of they had a good product. So they needed to create a strategic approach to market this good product because they understood that it was a good product, but it was a specific product. This wasn't just a great book. This was a really great book about wizards and an entire world. So how do we market something that is so specific, so one of a kind? You need that strong strategic approach. The third thing they used was emotional involvement. So for a lot of people, especially today in 2020, as I record this podcast, Harry Potter already has that emotional attachment to them. They are already emotionally involved with that series and with that world. I know girls and I know guys and I know people who have Harry Potter tattoos on them, who have included Harry Potter memorabilia in their wedding photos. I was once in a job interview and they asked me which Hogwarts house I belonged to. This is a thing that people are emotionally invested in now. So it's easy to sell to that now. Now they can sell things like wedding bouquets that are Slytherin themed or Ravenclaw pencil kits or Hufflepuff cheese puffs. I don't know. Um, But those are just examples of what they can sell to you now. But when it all got started, that emotional involvement wasn't there. So one of the marketing strategies they used was creating an emotional background and creating that emotional pull with their marketing. They never just marketed as being, this is a good book, read it. They marketed to, hey, let the child inside of you or let your child experience this world. They used their marketing to really try to draw out an emotional appeal rather than expect there to be an emotional appeal. The next thing they did is they teased their perpetual marketing. So this is really how they marketed everything past the first book. So, so far we've really been talking about how they marketed that first book, but this is now how they grew the universe from that one book. So the first book came out, all right, let's start teasing the second book. And by the time the second book had come out, they had already sold the movie, right? So let's start talking about the movies. And while the first movie's out, let's talk about the new book. And while the new book is being released, let's talk about the making of the next film. They never stopped. Everything was consistently growing and building on each other. There was never a time where one book was being released that a movie wasn't being made or vice versa or some sort of exterior project around Harry Potter was happening. Everything really built on each other so that the conversation never stopped being about Harry Potter. It was always in the news. It was always in the media. Even today, J.K. Rowling finds herself on Tumblr commenting on people's Harry Potter fan fiction. So she has never stopped growing and building on that universe. The next thing they did was create a distinct brand. So obviously a lot of this work was done when J.K. Rowling wrote the first book. She created a world that was about a boy wizard. And the book, because it's such a great book, does a wonderful job of describing that world in great detail so that you don't have to imagine anything really on your own. It's sort of all out there for you, which is a really great way to tell the story. There's no questions. I actually once heard... The J.K. Rowling has a list of every student that attended Hogwarts ever, and she just keeps it in her house. One day when she passes away, that list is going to be worth a billion dollars, if it's real. If I was her, I would totally start that as a rumor, and then like have a secret box in my house that says, like, list of Harry Potter characters, lock it, and then when I pass away and like my kids open it up, it just says, listen to the GSMC Marketing Podcast. Please subscribe. That's what I would put on it. Just as like a a fun prank from your mother who's passed away. (laughs) But anyways, even though they did have the distinct brand already baked into that first book, it was really up to them to always ensure that that distinct brand was consistent and in every little bit of their marketing. So from the first book, creating that distinct brand was so important because It was something she had worked really hard on in the book and by creating the book. And so they had to ensure that everything they created outside of it had that distinct brand. 
Because imagine if she had written the book and it was really dark and very moody, which there are those elements, but it's not really a, a dark, dark world at first. But imagine when the first book comes out that it was the world that we've seen today, but then all of the marketing for it was like rainbow and sunshines and fun witches and fun wizards instead of like the more darker tones that are in that book. Or vice versa, imagine if all the marketing was super dark and was super scary and this is a horror book, this is a horror movie, this is a scary film, then it wouldn't have been as impactful because it wouldn't have been that distinct of a brand. Part of what makes it so great is that it is both a scary film, a scary book, but also an enchanting book and an enchanting movie. So you do get a little bit of both, which makes it so distinct. The next thing they always did was they made sure that that distinct brand they created was consistent on all of their marketing platforms. Every book, every movie, all the worlds, all the merchandise, all of the Legos, all of the Broadway shows that might happen, everything that exists for Harry Potter is consistent with that distinct brand. You are never going to see a Slytherin robe that is lime green. No, they're emerald green. I'm a Slytherin. I know these things. But you're never going to see Harry Potter without his glasses. You are never going to see a version of Harry Potter come out where the scar is a heart, not a lightning bolt. There are just so many things that are so distinct about that brand. Over the seven books, over the eight movies, it is all consistent. That doesn't mean that the world doesn't grow and change with the times, but everything is consistent and to the letter of what they created when they first originated that distinct brand. The next thing they did was create a multi-channel approach. So again, it is not just a book series. It is not just a movie series. And when they marketed both of those, they made sure that they were distinct, but also they used multiple channels for their marketing. The books were never marketed on Tonight with Jimmy Fallon or I guess at the time it was probably David Letterman. They were never marketed in that way, but the movies sure were because it has to be different because they understand that when they're marketing something that's a book and a movie, they need to use a multi-channel approach rather than just targeting to this one demographic. Because here's the unfortunate thing. People who love the books maybe didn't watch the movies. And people who only watch the movies probably will never read the books. So it is super important that you understand who your demographic is and you use a multi-channel approach to target them. The final thing that they did, well, they did a lot of things, but the final thing we're going to talk about today is that they played off of the audience's personality. So a lot of what makes Harry Potter so great is the fandom that's built around it. People are wanting to be involved in this world and they want to know these characters personally and they want to be invited to Hogwarts and they want to be a wizard. They want to believe that this is a real world. So how Harry Potter decides to market to those people is by creating that world for them to explore. And they did that with the books. They did that with the movies, but they've since did that, especially with the theme park. They gave a real place for people to go and actually explore this world. And I'm not going to lie. I went to the Universal Studios theme park and it totally made me want to go out and buy the Harry Potter movies. So it is a never ending cycle of invite people into this world so that they want to explore the movie and the book world. But for them to even ever want to explore that world, they needed to read the books and the movies. So things are constantly just cyclical in the marketing world for Harry Potter. Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and take a short break from the podcast. But when we come back, I'm going to tell you how you can use those eight points we just went over in your own marketing to really build that fandom and build that excitement around your own product. So stay tuned for that because you are listening to the GSMC Marketing Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mackenzie Jaquish, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. 
Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Marketing Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mackenzie Jaquish, and on today's podcast, we are talking about the wizarding world of Harry Potter. Before the break, we talked about the eight strategies that they used to market the movie and create this beautifully expansive world that we all get to explore thanks to the marketing and due to the wonderful writing efforts of J.K. Rowling, but... In today's podcast, we're just talking about the marketing of it all. This is not the writing podcast. I'm not going to talk about how good the writing is. Instead, we're going to talk about how good that marketing is and how they were able to create a fandom and a world around these books about a little boy who finds out he is a wizard. So before the break, we talked about the top eight strategies that they used to market that world. And now that you're back, welcome back. We are going to talk about how you can use those eight strategies in your own marketing to really build that fan- fandom and build that excitement around your own product. Okay, so number one, the first thing was having a good product. Now, this is a question that I always ask people when I go in to be their marketing strategist, when I come in to evaluate companies, and you always have to find a right way to ask it, obviously. I don't want to go in and be like, do you have a good product? But does your product excite you? Does your product add value to your life? Does your product add value to your mother's life? That is such a good question to ask because I think it's so important that we all find value in our product. But if you think your product can give value to your mother, a person who we all care so much about, then you definitely think your product is super worthy and that you have a good product. But if you're like, oh no, I would not trust this product for my mother. I would not let her use it. Then what are you doing? Why are you selling it to other people? Why are you selling it to other people's mothers? Stop it. Instead, what you should always do, the first approach to any marketing, is ensure that you have a good product. And here's the thing. I believe that everybody listening to this podcast has a good product. But if you don't, it's okay. Find a way to make it better. It doesn't mean you have to start from scratch. It doesn't mean you have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. But find a way to make your product the best product it can be for you and for your mother, (laughs) to put it plainly. Um, It's so important that all of the marketing strategies I'm going to give you, they're all based around the idea that you have a good product. So number two, developing a strategic approach. So they had a very distinct brand when it comes to Harry Potter, and we're going to talk more about that later. But when you have such a distinct brand, when you have such a specific product, You need a strategic approach. You can't just throw paint at a wall and see what color looks best. No, you need to go to Home Depot, take a look at some color swatches, bring them home, tape them onto the wall, live with it for a week, see which one you like best. It's sort of a long process and it's a tiring process and it's a tedious process, but it's an important process because if you don't have a strategic plan when it comes to your marketing, then your good product, your great product is going to go to waste because it's not going to be marketed to the correct audience. It's not going to be targeted to the right people who want to buy it. You're not going to be able to sell it properly and you're going to end up failing with your product before it ever even had a chance to really fly. Number three, emotional involvement. So I talked about at the beginning of this list, do you like your product? Would you let your mother use this product? That's 
part one of finding an emotional involvement. You need to be emotionally involved with your product. You need to love it so much that you are willing to wake up at Saturday morning to go work on it. You need to love it so much that you are willing to cancel plans with your high school fling to work on your product. That's part one of emotional involvement. Because if you are so in love with your product in the same way that J.K. Rowling was so in love with Harry Potter and the book series she created, then you're going to be able to allow other people to fall in love with it the same way. Because that's part two. You need to create something that people are able to emotionally hook on to. And that might seem silly. You might be thinking, hey, Mackenzie, you're crazy. I sell water bottles. How are people going to be emotionally attached to water bottles? But that's the thing. There's a million different other water bottle companies out there for me to try. Why should I try yours? Why should I take a chance and buy your water bottle instead of water by Heather? So what you're looking for is to create emotional involvement with me and this water bottle. And it doesn't have to be deep emotion, guys. It doesn't have to be that I'm madly in love with this water bottle and I can't live a day without it. I won't drink water from anything else. But it should be no, um, I like this water bottle because I've been using it for a few years. It works really well. It's never broke. It's never leaked. And I really like it and I enjoy using it. That's as deep as the emotional involvement needs to go. I'm not looking for true love here. I'm looking for a long-term commitment, though. It's a little bit of a two-sided sword because you're not looking for that deep emotion, but you're looking for a long-term commitment. Basically, you're looking for like a very good workplace relationship. You like each other, you're going to continue liking each other while you work together, but it's not love. That is the kind of emotional attachment people should have with your product. They should like it so much that they're going to keep using it and they're going to keep utilizing it. But if you don't have a product that people are going to invest their entire life in, then that's okay. That is perfectly okay. I'm not saying that you need that in order to do Harry Potter marketing. But try to find the emotional hook in your product and make a marketing strategy that shows off that hook. Number four, tease and perpetual marketing. So this is what I talked about of how every time a Harry Potter book was released, a new movie was announced. Every time the movie was released, a new book was announced. When it was all said and done, suddenly the theme park was opening. Suddenly the new movies were coming out. Suddenly there was a Broadway show. Everything was always getting built on top of each other. And there's a difference between just growing this Harry Potter empire and to what I'm referring to right now of teasing and perpetual marketing. What I'm basically saying is, is that you should never stop talking about your product. You should never have a weekend or a day or a year go by, as crazy as I might seem, that some people would ever even consider doing that. But you should never have any length amount of time go by where there isn't a new conversation about your product. So if you end an event on a Saturday, then on Sunday, I want to see a post saying we have another event coming up next week. We have a new product being announced. We have a sale going on. When that sale ends, there should be a new sale. When that sale ends, there should be an event. When that event ends, you should have a promotion. When that promotion ends, you should have a giveaway. It never stops and it never stops growing because the conversation is never going to stop. So you can either be a part of it or you can be forgotten. Number five, create a distinct brand. So there were a ton of books being published around the time that the first Harry Potter book was. A ton of books. Why did Harry Potter stand out? Why did Harry Potter become the huge success that it is today? It's because it's distinct. It's because it's an original idea. It's because it's a one-of-a-kind idea. Now, I'm not saying that your water bottle company is a one-of-a-kind idea. I'm not saying that your water bottle idea isn't a one-of-a-kind idea. Maybe it is. Maybe you have found a way to keep my water bottle cold all day, except not too cold because it hurts my teeth. If you have, write a review down below. I want to buy your water bottle. But you need a distinct brand that's going to stand out from the other competitors of water bottles. If Water by Heather has blue water bottle waves on her water bottles, then you should not be doing the same thing. If Water Bottles by Heather has pink flamingos painted on her logo, then your logo should not have flamingos. You need to be distinct and original and really try to think outside of that box so that you can create that distinct brand. The next thing you need to do is be consistent with that brand. So again, 
if Heather's doing pink flamingos on her logo, so you decide to do orange pineapples on your logos, this is a weird water bottle company I'm describing, and I, I do realize that, don't worry. But if you're doing orange pineapples as your logo, then you need to make sure that everything you put out has an orange pineapple on it. It is so important that you be consistent with your brand and with your marketing. That way people can recognize you. That way people can build loyalty with you. It is so incredibly important, guys. So just keep that in mind. Number seven, a multi-channel approach. So this is a little bit what I was talking about earlier with that strategic approach. Your strategic approach might be, okay, I'm only going to target people who are on Instagram. And here's the thing. Absolutely do that. But I'm going to ask you to write down 10 reasons why you're only going to use Instagram. Because in the digital world that we're in today, just doing Instagram doesn't cut it unless you have 10 solid reasons as to why. You need a multi-channel approach for your product. It still needs to be strategic. If you know that your users are not on Twitter, don't tweet at them. If you think they're only on Instagram, maybe try doing something outside of the digital world where they also might be. Try partnering up with other companies on Instagram so you can do some cross-channel marketing. Don't just do Instagram ads and say you're done. Find other ways to explore it so that you can have a multi-channel approach so that you're really trying to contact that targeted audience. Finally, number eight, play off of your audience's personalities. So Harry Potter did that really well. They understood that once people fell in love with the world, they were going to want to explore the world more. And once they understood that, they were able to target and create content for those people. They were able to create an entire theme park for those people to go explore. They were able to create merchandise for you to bring into your wedding because they knew people were already like DIYing that. They understand that by creating all of this additional content, they were better able to supplement the audience and they were better able to target that key demographic and sell them more stuff because they understood that people wanted more stuff. So understand who your audience's personality is and play off of that. Like I said, if you know your audience is on Instagram, then play off of the fact that they're on Instagram. Talk about how much you're on Instagram. Talk about your product on Instagram. Show photos of it on Instagram. Have multiple Instagrams. Find a way to play off of that personality so that you can utilize it for your own benefit. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and take a short break from the podcast. But when we come back, I'm going to be talking about the world outside of the books. So stay tuned for that because you are listening to the GSMC Marketing Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mackenzie Jaquish, and I'll be right back. Are you a business owner? Someone interested in the latest news that might affect your business? Then check out the GSMC Business News Podcast, a show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings-on on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. The GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. And welcome back to the GSMC Marketing Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mackenzie Jaquish, and on today's episode, we are talking about Harry Potter and Harry Potter marketing. We are talking about the wonderful world of Harry Potter, how they created such a fantastic world using marketing, and the powerful words of J.K. Rowling. So before the break, I was telling you the top eight ways you can use their marketing strategies in your own marketing. And now that we are back from our break, welcome back. We are going to be talking about the world outside of the books, and we're going to talk about some of the marketing tactics they have used to help create that world. So the first thing they did was they created merchandise. So the total of toys and merchandise, makeup, all of that that has been sold is 7.3 billion U.S. dollars. 
that is just on the toys and on all of the merchandise, all of the costumes and all of that. Merchandise includes wands, costumes, toys, makeup, Lego, perfume, shoes, everything you can imagine under the sun has been created for Harry Potter and their merchandise. You can buy it at Walmart, Target, Hot Topic, Amazon, basically anywhere anything is sold, you can find something to do with Harry Potter. It is quite literally all over the world. The second thing they did was they created the amusement parks. So on June 18th in 2010, the Orlando Park was the first park to open. It took $200 million to create and it replaced Merland, the Lost Continent, at the Disney World theme park. The next park to open was at the Universal Studios in Japan. They have had the Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey ride as their main attraction since their opening on July 15th in 2014. It has two features that you will not find at any other park. These are the Black Lake and the Live Owls. The third park to open was the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Studios Hollywood. This officially opened on April 7th, 2016. So from 2010 to 2016, they have had three theme parks open and each of them bringing their own little bit of creativity. One of them has live freaking owls, you guys. That's a big deal. That's kind of amazing. I want to go there. And I also have to say I went to the one at Universal Studios Hollywood. It's really cool. Highly recommend. Even if you're not a Harry Potter fan, it was a lot of fun and super cool to walk into that world. So the movies. The first film was released on November 16th, 2001. The Chamber of Secrets was then released on November 15th, 2002. Finally, the third installment of the series was released on June 4th, 2004. So they had that November 15th and 16th date locked down for a while there. The fourth film, The Harry Potter and the Goblin of Fire, was released on November 18th, 2005. So really looking at this, guys, they had a movie released and they all sort of follow in that pattern. They had the movies released basically to the date every year for like seven or eight years. It, I think it in total it took 10 years to get the full series out because there was that break between 2002 and 2004. I also remember that being a very big thing in the media. People thought the kids were going to be too old to be playing the part. So they kind of had to speed up the other movies to speed up with the children's aging because they were getting quite old quite fast. Um, well, at a normal aging rate, I guess. I understand it's not really wizards. Um, but every year, basically to the date, they were pushing out a movie and the books are still being released. So this really goes back to that constantly pushing out the media and constantly talking about the series and the franchise so that the conversation never stopped for those 10 years that those movies were released. The total box office figure for all eight films in the series is $7,723,431,572 worldwide. Guys, I counted it down to the penny for you. You're welcome. So not only were there the main eight films, but they have since had spin-off films such as Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which grossed $814 million worldwide, with an additional $150 million spent on marketing. The sequel to that film, The Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes Against Grindelwald, grossed a total of $653.8 million worldwide. This was the lowest grossing Wizarding World installment to date. So that did worse than like the first movie, guys. And here's the thing. If the worst movie in your franchise made $653.8 million worldwide... That's not a bad Tuesday. That's not a bad number to have on your list, I gotta say. It is said that there will still be five films in this franchise, so we are going to have to wait and see if the movies maybe keep losing money like The Crimes of Grinswald did, or maybe they'll get back up to that original hype of the original eight Harry Potter books and movies. The final product I want to talk about that exists outside of the Harry Potter world is the Broadway show. So Harry Potter and the Cursed Child Part 1 and 2 is a sequel to Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, which is the final movie in the original franchise. And it was actually not written by J.K. Rowling. She may have overseen the script, but she actually did not write it. On its first eight-show week at Broadway's Lyric Theater, it grossed a record-breaking $2,138,859 dollars. 
So breaking records all over the place. They took over the book world. They took over the movie world. And now they have taken over Broadway. So stay tuned for that to see just how far that success grows and just keeps getting bigger and bigger over time. It really does, guys. It is amazing the world that exists outside of Harry Potter. You could never read one page of those books and still be heavily invested in this world thanks to the Broadway show, the spin-off movies, the original movies, and the merchandise that has been sold around the world. It is definitely a huge world that people take part of and embrace wholeheartedly. And from a marketing side, that's amazing that they were able to create something from a book series. And obviously the book series is great. I'm not trying to downplay that. But there really was such a creative and strong marketing team behind the Harry Potter series that I don't think gets enough credit because they really did create all of this extra stuff to go along with it. Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and take a short break from the podcast. But when we come back, I'm going to give you the top 10 other books that sold almost as many copies as Harry Potter. Nothing quite as big, but the marketing for all of these books have also been quite extraordinary and quite wonderful. So stay tuned for that because you are listening to the GSMC Marketing Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mackenzie Jaquish, and I'll be right back. Are you looking for a podcast that gives you all of the latest news from the world of finance? Then check out the GSMC Financial News Podcast. We'll delve into the ups and downs of the stock market, changes in the economy, and news from the world of real estate and technology. From breaking news on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or the overseas market, to updates on the bond market, if there's money to be made, we'll cover it on the GSMC Financial News Podcast. And welcome back to the GSMC Marketing Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mackenzie Jaquish, and thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. I have had so much fun talking about Harry Potter and Harry Potter marketing with you. And if you have any other questions, any concerns, or any thoughts on Harry Potter and Harry Potter marketing, please write them in the review down below or reach out through social media. I'm going to be tweeting about today's podcast a lot, so make sure you go continue the conversation with me over there on the GSMC Marketing Twitter page because I would love to hear from you and I would love to hear your thoughts on today's podcast. Okay, to wrap things up today, let's talk about the 10 other books that had very similar marketing to the Harry Potter world, but maybe didn't sell as much. But the marketing, you know, is still pretty killer. It's pretty great, guys. So we're going to take a look at those books. Number one, Goosebumps with 350 million sold. That's incredible. One of the downsides to this is that I think Goosebumps did have the possibility of being a world like Harry Potter, like a world that we could explore at least through film. But the Goosebumps movies featuring Jack Black were not as well received as the Harry Potter movies will say. Not saying they're not loved, not saying that people didn't enjoy them, but they didn't quite hit that Harry Potter success, you know? Perry Mason, which has over 300 million sold. So I'll be honest, I never heard of Perry Mason. But looking into the series for this podcast, I was definitely amazed at the fact that there are 52 books in this series. That is extraordinary. And honestly, it's the number one mystery author of all time who wrote them. And it's just fascinating, just the world that was created around these books that were written in 1933, all the way until 19 into the 1940s. And so it's super interesting that a book that, you know, is quite old now has survived a few decades is still so popular and people still are so in love with it and the series. Number three, 
Choose your own adventure. This has 250 million sold. Also very similar to Perry Mason. I had not heard of it before, but I was amazed to see the marketing behind it and also just a little intrigued with the books themselves for sure. Number four, Sweet Valley High had 250 million sold. Nancy Drew had 2 million sold. And what's really interesting about Nancy Drew having 2 million sold, I remember reading her at a young age. I remember reading the books with my mom at a young age and her reading them at a young age. I obviously don't remember my mom reading them at a young age, but she told me about it. Um, and now my younger sister's reading them. But what's going to be very interesting is that the Nancy Drew book series is now being turned into a CW TV show similar to Riverdale. So I'll be excited to see how her fandom and her marketing sort of grows and expands from this 200 million books sold to see if we maybe get up to that same level of Harry Potter hype because Riverdale's been pretty successful. So let's see what happens with Nancy Drew. Number six, The Babysitter's Club, 172 million copies sold. This just warms my heart. I love The Babysitter's Club. I love that entire world. It is obviously not as popular as Harry Potter, but it definitely is as expansive as Harry Potter and the world that was created. There are so many books. There are so many different versions of the books. There is a movie. There's been shows. There's been merchandise sold. That the world definitely is big and definitely does expand just the books or just the movies, similar to how Harry Potter is a lot bigger than just the books. Number seven, Star Wars, which had 160 million copies sold. Obviously, Star Wars is very similar to how big Harry Potter is. Some would probably argue that it's bigger and the world is more expansive because it absolutely is. Guys, as I'm saying this, how have I not done a Star Wars episode of this podcast I'm like writing that down in my notebook. That's a good idea because the world of Star Wars is just as big as Harry Potter and it might actually be bigger. It's definitely going to be worth looking into. So look forward to that podcast in the future. Number eight, Chicken Soup for the Souls has had 130 million copies sold. Chronicles of Narnia with 120 million sold. So this one's obviously belonging on the list. Oh my God. This one obviously belongs on the list because the world is expansive as Harry Potter. There are books, there are movies, there is a lot of merchandise that goes along with it. But we all know it's not as great as Harry Potter. It's never going to be as great as Harry Potter. So let's just stop pretending. But it does definitely belong on this list. Number 10, Twilight. I know, I don't want to compare Twilight to Harry Potter either. But the truth is, Twilight sold 100 million copies. This one obviously belongs on the list. All right, everyone, that is it for today's podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you liked today's podcast, make sure you subscribe. We post new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Marketing Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mackenzie Jaquish, and I'll see you next time.